I'd like to begin by thanking Yasmin and the meeting organizers for inviting me to speak on my experiences and perspectives as a neuropathologist who analyzes and applies molecular diagnostic information into the routine diagnosis of CNS tumors at our institution. Much like other tumor types, classification of CNS tumors was originally based on their close resemblance to normal cellular components of the CNS, and this is really what formed the basis for our diagnostic approach. The morphologic appearance of these tumors is what allowed us to assign a tumor class, and each tumor class had a unique grading scheme. For example, shown below in this table is the 2007 WHO grading scheme for diffuse gliomas. And once a tumor grade had been assigned, only then could a treatment approach be planned with predictions for prognosis and treatment responses. However, over the past 30 years or so, uh, molecular technologies have rapidly evolved from fairly focal assays to comprehensive genome-wide copy number and next-gen sequencing technologies, which, when applied to large data sets, has really improved our understanding of the dis disease diversity and biology for many CNS tumor types, and this culminated ultimately in the 2016 update of the WHO classification system for CNS tumor types. Shown on the right here is an example of many of the diagnostic entities in this edition, many of which, indicated here, have a new molecular component to their diagnosis. So this has had allowed for a new diagnostic approach in neuropathology, which now combines traditional light microscopic information with new molecular diagnostic information to come up with a combined integrated tumor diagnosis, and so on and so forth. However, molecular data in and of itself sometimes is able to provide diagnostic information. There are many entities for which a molecular definition exists. Furthermore, molecular information can facilitate tumor grading, and in the age of targeted therapies, many genomic alterations can facilitate targeted treatment approaches irrespective of tumor appearance. At Brigham and Women's, we've had the following molecular testing workflow for approximately the past eight years or so, and this is uh, shown here in this diagram. Essentially, all tumor types that come through our service are profiled by a combination of chromosomal microarray array and targeted exome sequencing testing, and this allows us to issue routine integrated diagnoses for our cases. In addition, this facilitates enrollment for many of our patients into a novel biomarker-based clinical trials and facilitates significant investigational efforts as well. Speaking briefly about consensus guidelines for issuing an integrated diagnosis, the International Society for Neuropathology discussed this very idea in 2014 and came up with a recommended four-layer system for an integrated diagnosis. This system includes the traditional histologic classification and a tabular summary of relevant clinical molecular information to arrive at a combined integrated diagnosis and integrated WHO grade. So for example, in this tumor, this is an uh, embryonal appearing tumor, small round blue cells that are densely packed. Some cells have a rhabdoid appearance, and by immunohistochemistry there is loss of INI1 protein by immunohistochemistry. Using this four-layer integrated diagnosis system, this is histologically an embryonal tumor with rhabdoid features, and the loss of INI1 by immunohistochemistry allows us to issue the specific integrated diagnosis of atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor WHO grade 4. In the absence of INI1 loss or BRG1 loss, we would be left with the histologic impression of embryonal tumor with rhabdoid features. Either way, this would still be a grade 4 tumor. This system was similarly applied to diffuse gliomas as an example, so for tumors that have a prominent astrocytic appearance with hyperchromatic pleomorphic nuclei and retention of 1p19q and IDH mutant, this could be ac accurately classified as a diffuse astrocytoma with IDH mutation. Similarly, an oligodendroglioma with 1p19q co-deletion could be specifically diagnosed as such. 
and tumors that have either ambiguous morphology or conflicting molecular information would be left with more descriptive diagnostic headers. So for our paradigm in adult diffuse gliomas, we know that many of these are diseases of copy number alterations, the prototype, of course, being IDH wild-type glioblastomas, which carry the very characteristic triad or quartet of cytogenetic features that include gain of chromosome 7, a single copy loss of chromosome 10, sometimes with homozygous loss of P10, and homozygous focal loss of CDKN2A. And there's often amplification of EGFR or other receptor tyrosine kinase. Similarly, oligodendrogliomas have characteristic whole arm co-deletions of 1P and 19Q that are easily detected by genome-wide copy number testing. And even IDH mutant astrocytomas and other tumor types can have routine copy number alterations that are easily detected by this technology. Now, while many glioblastomas have this characteristic co copy number signature, it's important to note that many do not fall neatly into um, that signature that is shown above, and it is important to really rely on the histologic impression when making this diagnosis, given the diversity of alterations that are often present in this tumor. By contrast, many tumor types have an overlapping array of morphologies, and it is not infrequent that we run across tumors that are misclassified initially as glioblastoma based on their high-grade features. Routine profiling of these tumors with a copy number test such as chromosomal microarray easily picks out those that don't fall into this category, such as this anaplastic oligodendroglioma shown here. Briefly, it's important to note that while we have used chromosomal microarray and targeted sequencing technologies in tandem for many of our tumor types, it is not necessary to perform both of these in many instances. Most targeted sequencing panels that are available in many institutions are more than sufficient to detect low-level and focal events that are clinically relevant for many tumor types. Beyond the necessity for facilitating diagnosis, molecular diagnostics and glioblastoma in particular are increasingly more useful for helping to enroll patients onto novel multi-arm biomarker-based clinical trials such as that depicted here. Furthermore, in a glioblastoma trial in our institution, we found that approximately half of these patients have targetable events with currently existing therapeutics, and this is something that is probably going to be of increasing importance to many clinicians around the country. Speaking briefly about the quote-unquote low-grade IDH wild-type gliomas, this is a tumor type that is long plagued neuropathologists given the disparate histology and natural history of these tumor types. When taking into account IDH and 1P19Q status, the survival for many of these tumors is essentially synonymous with glioblastoma. And to address this issue, a CMPAC now consortium was formed uh, made up of many of the WHO authors and clinicians to issue interim updates between WHO editions for many of these gaps in practice that uh, become evident through time. So for this particular tumor type, these are astrocytomas by morphology that have low-grade histology and the presence of one or a combination of these three molecular alterations. So a new diagnostic term was coined to address these tumor types of diffuse astrocytic glioma IDH wild type with molecular features of glioblastoma. This not only better captures the natural history of these tumor types, but facilitates uh, aggressive therapy that is warranted in these tumors. So for example, here is a case that we recently had in our service. This was a tumor in an elderly patient that had no evidence of contrast enhancement, and on biopsy, it's very palsy-cellular, almost indistinguishable from normal brain, but there are a few hyperchromatic atypical cells that don't appear to be uh, belong there in normal brain tissue. And so this was signed out on microscopic examination as an infiltrating glioma that will be further classified and graded upon integrating with molecular testing. And once that came back, we can see many features that are characteristic of an IDH wild-type glioma namely a hint of uh, gain of chromosome 7 and loss of 10, 
with a focal loss of 9p at CDK N2A and an amplification event of PDGFRA. There's also a P10 frame shift mutation in this tumor, and so this allows us to reclassify the tumor according to the C-impact now recommendations as a diffuse astrocytic glioma with molecular features of glioblastoma. And to really indicate the utility of this approach, this very patient actually underwent another resection only four weeks later. And in that time frame, the tumor had rapidly evolved into an obvious glioblastoma, which is now densely cellular evidence of vascular proliferation and necrosis and a very elevated mitotic rate was apparent in this specimen. Transitioning now to talk about pediatric gliomas, these are really a diverse array of morphologies, some of which overlap with adult diffuse gliomas, but many are unique to this patient population and can occur throughout the neuroaxis. What makes this even more challenging to classify these tumors accurately is that many different morphologies have overlapping driver events, indicating the promiscuity of many of the MAP kinase pathway alterations in pediatric low-grade gliomas. Further indicating the uniqueness of this group of tumors is the fact that unlike adult low-grade gliomas, pediatric low-grade gliomas rarely transform, and tumors that are able to receive gross total resection often behave very indolently with long-term survival. To address this conundrum, CMPAC now issued Another update on these diffuse gliomas in the pediatric population, issuing uh, a recommendation instead of trying to um, issue specific morphologic diagnoses to instead have a more vague diffuse glioma classification nomenclature that then tacks on the uh, specific alteration that is, is the driver event. So in this particular instance, this was an MYB fusion in a diffuse glioma type histology. And this is really to address the fact that these tumors are fairly unique and probably should be classified very differently from their adult counterparts. At our institution, we'll actually carry this one step further and include a low-grade or high-grade designation based on the histology to help guide the clinicians as to how aggressive to manage these patients. Given the diversity of driver events in pediatric low-grade gliomas, many different workflow algorithms have been proposed, such as that shown here, that take into account both location of tumor and the morphologic appearance and a variety of focal uh, testing options are shown here. Um, but really the kind of overarching theme is that a uh, next-generation sequencing platform is really required to test the majority of these events and is probably the highest yield to perform in these tumors on a routine basis. That being said, many tumor types are driven by structural variants and intriguingly, these events are often the result of intrachromosomal deletions or duplication events. And so if these tumors are profiled by a a high-resolution copy number test such as chromosomal microarray, one can often infer the presence of a structural variant based on one of these focal deletions or gains such as that are, that are seen in pilocytic astrocytomas or angiocentric gliomas. Pediatric high-grade gliomas, by contrast, are often driven by point mutations in chromatin-modifying genes such as histone 3, for example, and Many of these tumors do not have highly stereotypical copy number profiles. So again, much like the pediatric low-grade gliomas, a next-gen sequencing approach is probably of highest yield in attempting to diagnose these tumors accurately. I briefly wanted to cover diffuse midline gliomas. This is a new entity for 2016, which includes the previous diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma entity. These are high-grade gliomas by histology that are located within the midline, so brainstem, spinal cord, and thalamus. They can have a variety of histologic appearances, some of which can overlap with oligodendrogliomas, for example. But the unifying feature is that they all contain K27M mutations in either of the H3 isoforms. And this is a grade 4 tumor by definition, really irrespective of uh, presence of high-grade features by histology. 
So for example, here is a tumor in a child that occurred in the cervical medullary junction that was contrast enhancing and intraaxial. On the biopsy specimen, it had features of ganglioglioma, so there's a clear neoplastic glial component, these smaller atypical cells in the background, and clear neurons uh, also present. The lack of staining by new and a mature neuronal marker indicates that these are part of the neoplasm, and diffuse presence by the mutation-specific BRF E600E antibody indicates um, this is indeed a ganglioglioma. Given the midline location, however, histone 3 staining was also performed, and we can see that many of the tumor cells are positive for this stain. So this leads to a diagnostic conundrum when attempting to integrate this, this case. Both of these mutations were confirmed by sequencing, but by histology we're left with a grade 1 tumor, a ganglioglioma, but grade 4 given the presence of the histone mutation. So how do we, how do we handle such a case? Fortunately, this is not um, an unknown event. Many have published smaller series on these types of tumors, showing that many of the patients have uh, survival in the multiple years or longer, although they do appear to be more aggressive than a grade 1 tumor would be expected to behave. So what is the natural history of these tumors? We're not entirely sure. It's clearly not one and clearly not four, is all we can say for now. To address this issue and the fact that uh, other circumscribed gliomas, such as ependymomas, have been shown to harbor H3K27M mutations, the CMPAC now consortium issued another update uh, refining the criteria for the diagnosis of diffuse midline gliomas. Clearly this is a diagnosis that should only apply to tumors that are diffusely infiltrating that are high grade in astrocytic and morphology and obviously still harbor the H3K27 in mutation. I think further it is important to avoid using this nomenclature if a tumor shows uh, a secondary driver in BRAF, RAF1, or FGFR1, which occasionally occur, and uh, it's still unclear as to how those tumors will behave long term and um, should probably be handled more descriptively. Finally, I wanted to address um, a few instances in which over-reliance on a single modality such as you know, either histology or a molecular result can lead to misclassification of some tumors. So one of the first tumor types that can be problematic is uh, one that is depicted here. This is a tumor occurring in a young adult patient in a hemispheric location. It has uh, a somewhat embryonal appearance on H&E, there's uh, small round blue cells that are comprising the majority of the tumor, a delicate fibrillary background that is somewhat resembling neuropil, certainly not the coarsely fibrillar appearance we expect for glial tumors. Glial markers by immunohistic chemistry are negative. OLIG2 is shown here. GFAP is really just highlighting the background blank brain elements that are being infiltrated by the tumor. And synaptophysin shows diffusely punctate staining in tumor cells. So by histologic examination alone, it would be easy to call this an embryonal tumor and begin on the incorrect treatment plan. Fortunately, sequencing was performed on this tumor, and we see that this is, in fact, a pediatric glioblastoma with an H3G34R mutation, which is characteristic of these hemispheric tumor types. And the mutations that are found are consistent with this entity, and we also see the characteristic copy number signature that includes PDGFRA amplification. The next example is a tumor that um, contains a misleading molecular result. So by contrast, this is an older patient that had another hemispheric tumor. And by H&E examination, we get a sense that there are some features that would suggest pilocytic astrocytoma as a diagnosis. There's a suggestion of a biphasic appearance, a section that's more loose and palsicellular and more compact areas by contrast. In the looser areas we can see some tumor cells with elongated nuclei and long bipolar fibrillar processes. There's also some tumor cells that contain these uh, multinucleate giant cell appearance, the so-called pennies on a plate, which are characteristic of pilocytics. 
There are also some eosinophilic granular bodies that are present in the background and maybe a hint of a Rosenthal fiber or two if you look carefully. In other areas, there's evidence of glomeruloid vascular proliferation, which is shown in this right panel, which are characteristic of pilocytics, as are areas of significant perivascular arrangement of tumor cells. So BRAF FISH was performed on this case, and lo and behold, there was a rearrangement that was detected. However, given the somewhat unusual features of this tumor, it didn't quite look perfect for a pilocytic array, and next-gen sequencing was performed, and this BRAF fusion, in fact, was uh, a TRIM24 BRAF fusion event and not the KIAA1549 fusion that's characteristic of pilocytic astrocytomas. Furthermore, the copy number profile of this tumor shows the characteristic features of glioblastoma, namely gains on 7, loss of 10, and CDK and 2A, and this is in fact a glioblastoma that happens to harbor a BRAF fusion event, and that's really what leads to that confusing morphology and is uh, interesting in its own right, but certainly can, can lead to misclassification. Finally, there are examples in which both tumor appearance and molecular results are somewhat confusing. So here's an example of a tumor in which uh, there are some features of glioblastoma, some palisading necrosis shown in the upper left corner here. There's also a fascicular spindle cell component running through the lower right portion of this image, somewhat suggesting maybe a gliosarcomatous variant of glioblastoma. But if we look more carefully, there are not the tumor vessels that we're used to seeing in glioblastoma. Instead, seeing dilated, thin-walled vasculature and some tumor cells that contain prominent eosinophilic uh, hyaline globules, which are, are fairly unusual for a glial tumor. Furthermore, immunohistochemistry shows absence of staining for glial markers and diffuse staining for desmond, which would be unusual perhaps indicating a myogenic line of differentiation for this tumor. When sequencing was performed on this, we uh, similarly saw some unusual features. The copy number signature for this tumor is fairly nonspecific. It's highly aneuploid, but doesn't really resemble a conventional glioblastoma per se. And the pathogenic variants that were detected are shown here by allelic inactivation of DICER1 and P53. So clearly this seems to be something unique and uh, doesn't line up with uh, glioblastoma necessarily. And so the integration of these two allowed us to diagnose this tumor as a high-grade pleomorphic sarcoma that's associated with DICER1. And this tumor type has actually been described recently by both UCSF and uh, Heidelberg groups, showing many of the features that were recently discussed here. So the takeaway here is that in the event that both histology and genomic features do not align well with a known entity, I think it's worth taking pause and considering, is this something unique? Is it uh, a different tumor type um, than perhaps we were considering, or perhaps something novel altogether and undescribed? Which leads me to the final topic that I wanted to briefly mention, and that is DNA methylation as a diagnostic tool in CNS tumors. This is a highly in vogue uh, platform that is being uh, widely advocated in the community. Um, although the number of institutions that currently offer this as a clinical test are relatively few. This platform, in addition to offering um, uh, indirect copy number analysis, can also be useful in its ability to uh, cluster a tumor type with an existing array of tumors in uh, existing databases and in that sense can uh, aid as a confirmatory diagnostic tool and even facilitate more importantly the diagnosis of novel events for tumors that don't cluster with known entities. I do think it is important however to note that um, this assay would necessarily require uh, companion diagnostics with a next-generation sequencing platform, for example, if one wants to obtain driver mutational or structural variant information. And uh, it's also important to recognize that no single diagnostic um, technology should or can be a surrogate for careful microscopic examination. 
I think the more that we profile these tumors, we're finding uh, an overlapping array of molecular features, and really those have to be interpreted within the context of histology to arrive at the most accurate diagnosis and um, natural history for a tumor. So in summary, the recent WHO update has included um, a wide array of molecular diagnostic information into the classification scheme, but this has created new challenges and gaps in classification. The C Impact Now Committee has uh, been dedicated to addressing many of these as increasing uh, studies are published every day to uh, highlight new genomic features and new entities. But I think it's important that in the routine clinical practice there is no single test which is really best for all tumor types. It really has to be considered within the context of each tumor and furthermore what is best regarding institutional policies and practices. And then finally, as I mentioned, it is imperative that we interpret all genomic events within the context of both histology and clinical parameters in order to arrive at the most accurate diagnosis and natural history information for these tumor types. So I hope this has been useful and I would be happy to take any questions at this time.